Hey, welcome back. I'm Adam. I'm Felix. And we are hopefully here to help you become the best entertainer and performer possible. Thanks for joining us. As always, none of these videos are monetized. If you want to support what we do, just go to volpinecreations.com. That's all the plugin will do. Let's dive right in. What are we talking about today, Felix? All right, our friend Purple Potato uh, put down a comment two videos ago about routining. So how to structure a show, how to build out your routine. And this is exactly what we're going to answer today. So how do you string a show together? Thank you for the question or comment, Purple Potato. Funny side story, when uh, many moons ago when I did kids shows, the magic word I always had the kids say was purple potato. So it was funny to see that. But the question I get asked a lot is exactly that. How do you put together a show that flows, right? You can piece together, let's say seven magic tricks, but how do we know that those are going to fit in a show that adds the drama that we were talking about in the uh, book club section? Uh, there are a lot of trains of thought on this. I, I have a specific one I use as a five act structure, but there's some other great literature on this Dan Harlan has some awesome, um, More Than Meets the Eye, I believe is the name of the PDF, uh, the book that it's in, and he's got a great template that you can use as well. Um, I'll break it down very quickly, but we're also going to add a link in the description below where you can download this PDF. And it's uh, essentially a way that you can structure a show in what we're going to go over here. So Felix, I know, has some questions, so I'll go over the five-act structure briefly. You can dive into it on your own, and then we'll dive into Felix's questions that um, sort of condenses that. So what is a five-act structure? A five-act structure. Simply put, it's breaking my show up into five acts, okay? The, both of, or I'm sorry, all five of the acts have usually two effects in them. Sometimes on the last act, the fifth act, I, I leave it for one effect. So act one, right? That's when we're walking out on stage. And I consider the beginning of the act is the second that you're introduced on stage. So the act isn't your first trick. It's, again, if we're talking about drama, what walk on music, what, what feeling do I want them to get from the first act? Uh, we'll have an overlay on here, but you'll say it says, you'll see that it says fast and strong hello. Right? So in one way or another, we need to grab the audience's attention quickly. That's why a lot of times you'll see performers open with a very quick visual piece of magic, like um, bot bottle out of balloon. Um, what's another really great visual opener? Vanishing bottle by Michael Yama. Vanishing bottle is a great one. So something that's within that first minute to minute and a half going to show a visual piece of magic that stuns the audience. We're trying to get them... At least in my mind, what I'm trying to do is say, hey, you might have seen a magician before, but not like this. And here, let me show you quickly. OK, I want them to go. Oh, that was pretty neat. So I always open with a vanishing bottle. I think it's a funny bit of humor that gets the audience laughing. And right at the moment when they're like, is this a comedian or a magician? Something magical happens. And that happens within a minute. OK, so it's a fast and powerful hello. Uh, as far as walking on stage, I just want to well, actually, you know what, we're going to do a whole video on that. I know it sounds ridiculous, but there's enough to be said about how you walk on stage. So we're just going to be talking about the routining. First effect, fast and powerful, lets the audience know who you are, what your character is. And uh, Michael Yamaha has this in one of his Penguin lectures where he says he does the appearing bottle with a handkerchief, mm -hmm. like he's, he's whipping the handkerchief and then a bottle appears right in his hand. Yep. And uh, what he says is that he's also preps the audience to pay attention because things could happen from one second to another. Cool. Yep, that's great. So vanishing bottle would work in the same way. If they've blinked, they missed the second you crumpled up the bottle yeah. and now it's like, yeah, you better watch. Awesome point. Uh, the second routine is still kind of a quick one to, to keep the, the flow of the show moving, right? Keep them engaged and going. So for me, I do silk to egg, but quickly on in silk to egg, I tell them I'm going to teach you a trick. Again, holding their attention. They think you're going to teach them something, show them a magic secret, and get into it. Uh, both of those are pretty punchy effects that are both pretty visual and fooling. So within that first act, which is usually about seven minutes, I've got the audience's attention. I've laid down my character. They know who I am. They know I'm a goofy, jokey kind of magician that I don't come out and take myself very seriously. If you do, Again, you're almost overemphasizing your character in these first couple minutes, right? You want them to know what they're getting into. So act one is fast and strong hello. 
So now we move into act two, which is getting the audience involved. It's a great place to get a spectator up. So if you're due, uh, I don't know, Celebrity Smartass by Bill Abbott, uh, Color Psychology by Volpine Creations soon, uh, whatever it is, it's a great time to get the audience involved, get a fun audience member up. Maybe you've scanned the audience in your first two effects in act one, and now it's time to have some fun with them. So I'm gonna find the one who was having the most fun and bring them up on stage. I usually do two bits in, in act two, and one of those two effects, I'll get an audience member up. These again, they don't have to be as punchy and as fast, but you do wanna keep the pace going pretty heavily. You don't wanna slow down and do a longer mentalism piece or something that you're gonna to have to think too heavy on. We really wanna save those for act three and four when we've got the audience on board and they're, they're in for the ride at this point. And act two is also a good place to sort of humanize yourself and let the audience know that you're part of them. You're all in this together. If your character is that you're not and that you have some mental powers or magic abilities that the average person doesn't, that's okay. You can humanize that character by telling a story um, that is relatable to that character. Okay, so this is a, a good sort of bond building part. You've won them over with the visual eye candy of act one and letting them know who your character is. Act two is about getting somebody from the audience, having some fun, and then letting them know a little bit about you personally or a little bit about your character. Maybe what drives your character? What fears do your character have, right? We're setting the scene of the character as if we were watching a movie. This would be the point where maybe we're telling a bit of the backstory of the main hero of the movie, something like that. Can I ask a question at this Please. point? Please. All right. So when you're talking about getting the audience involved or sharing a story, then... Um, for me, this sounds like this is the point in, in the whole presentation where you try to build rapport with them and win them over. We were discussing about this several times, and I don't know if, we, if we're going to um, talk about this in this video, walking on stage, mm -hmm. but you have roughly 30 seconds. Uh, you have only one chance for a first impression, yep. and you don't want to lose them right away. Sure. And in which, in which of those acts would you say? The first act. From when you walk on stage, you should be doing everything you can to build that rapport. Your yeah. first minute, minute and a half yeah. is where you want to win them over. You're never going to win everyone over, but that's where you really want them to like you in mm -hmm. that first 30 seconds to a minute, right? So some entertainers will spend a lifetime working on their opening lines, mm -hmm. things like that. The entire routine and the entire show is building rapport with the audience. Yeah. There might be an effect in there where it's confrontational but the majority of the show, unless you're an insult comedian or something like that. And even they build rapport in a different way. Mm -hmm. But the main, for me at least, the main point where I want them to love me is in that first two minutes, that first effect. I want them to know, oh, okay, this guy's funny, I like this guy, we're gonna have fun. So then in act two, you're reinforcing by sharing something personal or a story about you, just to reinforce that their first impression is right. Sure. And they can follow you on the journey without being disappointed. Exactly, yep. Mm -hmm. Then we move into act three, and I have act three structured where your blockbuster is in act three. That's your, the, the trick you think is the hardest hitting, your, your grand slam home run effect. So you're right about the middle of the show and you hit them with something extremely powerful, something very, very fooling. And then end that with something that's very personal to you, right? Uh, maybe a favorite performance piece of yours, telling a story about your children or, or something of that nature. But in act three is where I like to hit them with uh, one of, if not the closer, because the closer can be your strongest, at least the second best to the closer. So you want something really, really fooling in there, really powerful, that, that trick that people come up to you and go, dude, the show is great, but this? So, you know, think sign bill to lemon, um, Cody Fisher's killer prediction, you know, things that are really strong pieces of magic. I start, that's how I start act three, and I usually finish up act three with either like a, a show of skill, um, so maybe I'll do 51 cards to pocket, something that shows I'm, I'm talented sleight of hand wise, uh, or another personal piece, you know, a story about me or something that is really fun for me to perform. You know, something I just enjoy performing, my rope routine, I really enjoy performing. And I, I think that love of it really 
uh, resonates with the audience. They can see how much fun I'm having with it, right? They, they can see I'm passionate about that routine specifically. And I'm not shy to tell them that either, to say, you know, I really love this routine. I've done this for 25 years of my life. Um, and that act three is usually about, it's two effects and it's usually about 10 minutes. So maybe one effect is seven minutes, the blockbuster, and then a rope routine follow-up is three minutes, right? So it's, uh, it's ebbing and flowing. And if you look at act one, there's two effects about seven minutes, right? That first effect's a minute and a half. The next effect might be five minutes. Then we go into act two, that's going to be about 10 minutes. And once again, I, if the first effect is a minute and a half and the second is five, my third effect in the show is usually going to be another shorter piece and then a longer piece. So there's just this sort of constant up and down of how long each piece is. So it doesn't feel... For instance, if you put three effects together that are all nine minutes long and you anchor them with a minute trick and a minute trick, the minute trick might hook them, then they watch nine minutes of an effect, then they get into another nine minute effect. There's a good chance that you're gonna lose their attention by drawing these effects out one after another. So if you can do shorter and then longer effects, and it doesn't have to be one after another, but just try not to string too many long effects in a row because it can be hard for the audience to maintain that attention. So also uh, mixing visual, more visual effects to effects where you really have to follow the story to get the point. Yep. Yeah. A mental, like how much mental energy are they going to have yeah. to put into each effect? People need breaks, right? That's the idea of building tension and then relieving it. If you're just tension, 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 or focus, focus, focus the whole time, it's exhausting to an audience. So you've got to, Look at your show and say, how much am I asking of the audience? With the bottle opener, I start by having the audience yell. So I'm asking a little bit, but I'm just trying to get their energy up, right? So in the first act, I'm getting them to feel okay yelling and making noise, okay? Uh, it's a, something we didn't touch on, but that first effect you do, it's a great idea to either have them all clap along. That's why a lot of keynote speakers, when they walk on stage, they'll be like, everyone stand up, shake your arms out. They're not doing it for any other reason except to let them know it's okay to move around. You don't have to sit here quietly and watch this. So, um, ah, sorry. Um, yep, yeah, sorry. So to the point, it's about really the mental energy. If it's something visual where they don't have to do anything but watch, then follow it up with something where maybe it's a little headier and they have to think about it, like a mentalism piece or something. Um, and when I say long effects in a row, that's just a lot of mental energy, even if they're all just visual. You know, 18, 19, 20 minutes of just visual magic becomes draining on, on its own. So um, always be, be aware of what you're asking of your audience in each effect. And it, don't ask too much of them, right? Um, you're sort of the guide. You're guiding them through this adventure. And if it's, if it's too intense for too long and there's no relief, no, no points for them to relax, it makes them uneasy. It's not going to be a pleasure to watch. On the other hand... If you get them tense and tense and then they get to relax and then the next thing they can kind of relax through and just enjoy and then it builds up to some more tense, tense, tense. Maybe you hold the tense for a little longer and then a relief and then you hit them with something really visual. Just be very aware of that ebb and flow of your show. What are you asking of your audience? I mean, it's also interesting to watch stand-up comedians, especially when they are changing story points or switching from one story or one joke to another mm -hmm. because... Um, This, this is also something that you, you, can, you can basically track with a notepad, time it. You will see that the first one is pretty short and up to the point. Yep. Where, very close to be offending, but they get the attention. Then something they can, they can relax again, get accustomed to what's happening. And then it's always an ebb and flow. A longer story, so they can a bit relax, but, but can be abused. Hmm. And then a short, hard-hitting pieces just to get them get their, their blood pressure up again. Sure, yeah. That's an interesting thing. Maybe look at some of the best hour-long comedy specials and time, how long are each jokes? Yeah. Um, and it'd probably be a very good reference on any show structure, regardless of what you're doing. You'll see that the jokes, they probably fall into a pattern in, as far as length. But um, comedy's a bit different because one, some comedians can have one joke through the entire you know, hour-long special. But, um, you know, again, just know what you're asking of your audience and make sure it's not, not monotone, because monotone would be how you're speaking, but if you're thinking of the building of tension and relieving it, make sure that's not, 
you know, you want that to have sort of a wave motion. Um, it's okay to elongate some of them, but you want to make sure that you're giving them the, the time to relax and breathe a little bit. So in act four, this five, five stage, um, five act structure is about a 45 minute act as far as it's timed out in the PDF you can download. In act four, you're going to do about 15 minutes and build to a conclusion. So whatever the main message or theme or purpose of your show is, you're reinforcing that, right? It, for me, it's, it's entertainment and comedy. So I have some really, co really comedic and funny bits in act four. Act four is also where I do my book test, which is in my opinion, one of the strongest things I do in the, in the show. So I'm reinforcing my character of humor and lightheartedness and corniness in act four, but it's also got a real blockbuster in there as well with the book test. So we're right close to the end now. And I want that the main tension and relief to be on the second to last trick I'm doing. So that's going to be the second trick in act four. Act four is about 15 minutes. And I split both of these up. They're about seven minutes each. So my act four is two somewhat longer pieces, but I wave that drama and tension and release by the first one being very comedic based and a true story about me and my childhood. And the second one being a really still funny, but heavy piece of mentalism that it makes them think very, very hard. What that allows me to do is set up my main message or my takeaway for act five. So I've made them laugh at the beginning of act four. I've hit them with something really heavy at the, at the end of act four. And now as I'm going into act five, what I'm hoping is that they go, man, this is incredible. I've never seen anything like that. How in God's name could he have done? That truly is impossible. What's he going to show me next? Now I have them sort of in the palm of my hand for act five, which I believe is, in my opinion, the strongest part of, of the show because it's what they're going to remember you by, right? A lot of performers say you end with your very strongest piece. Um, sure, that's a great way to, to go. End with your strongest piece, they'll remember that. But you can also end with your strongest piece and essentially do an encore, right? Bands do that. They play their hit song, everyone freaks out, and then they walk off like it's done. Mm -hmm. They come back on and leave you with one other. That one other might be a song from their new album. So people are going, whoa, what the hell was that? Um, so in act five, what I'm trying to do is whatever. Now, it, let's say you're, you're working corporate and they're, they've hired you for the change is the way themed uh, conference. And they really want you to instill change is the way. And that's the messaging. Act five is where I'll develop a routine that I can script around change is the way. So just off the top, that could be a color change on a jumbo index flat card mm -hmm. or, you know, um, the point being act five is one smaller piece. Sometimes it's not even a piece of magic. Um, it might be the reveal. So in my a act five, revelation. what's that? A cryptex revelation. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, in my theater act that I just did uh, six months ago, my act five was a, a heartfelt message to my audience as I revealed a clock reveal and then a, a secondary reveal. So there's no magic happening. It's just these two reveals pretty much tied the entire show up, right? So the, one of the reveals is everything that happened in the show. And the last reveal is a clock and I have a message about time. So while there's no magic in it, it's still a very important part of my show. It's an act in itself because it's my, my last message to them, what I want them to take away. Um, it doesn't have to be done that way, right? Act four really could just be extended into three tricks and you close with a blockbuster. And I've seen a lot of, of magicians do it that way and there's nothing wrong with that. I like to give some sort of message, um, you know, whether it's to make them think differently or if it's to tie into whoever hired me, their main event. Last night is a perfect example. I'm here in Vienna, Austria. We were doing a show in, what was it called? Palais Coburg. Amazing event. For a 75 year old, um, I thought he was 75. I think 75. I'm glad I didn't say happy 75th then. Yep. But we were, we were, I was, <laughs> <laughs> we were hired to do the birthday. So the very last effect was Cuban bottle after the show was essentially over. And we got his daughter up to do Cuban bottle. And then she gave the cube to him as the birthday gift. So the theme of that event was a birthday. So the message or the takeaway was act five. 
And I didn't even do the magic, his daughter did. But the point being the, the act five or the, the end of the acts, if you want to extend it to act four, maybe it's your last line, should in some way tie together what you want them to leave with. What do you want them to remember you uh, or your show by? So in summary, act one, you're greeting them. Hey, hello, this is who I am. Wham, bam, thank you, ma'am. This is going to be quick and you should pay attention. Act two, we're getting them a little more involved. Get some audience members up on stage. Have some fun with them. Keep building your character and letting them know who you are on stage and what your purpose of the show is. And again, don't overthink this stuff. You don't have to change the world with this. If you're just a comedy magician, maybe your purpose is to make them laugh. You put a comedy piece in there, okay? Act three are your, hard, your heavy hitters, something that's really gonna punch them. Wow, how did they do that, right? You really wanna hold them with the impact of the wonder and astonishment and not lean so heavily on the humor, okay? Act four is building to your conclusion. Act four is also a great time to get audience members involved as well. Um, pick the people that you've noticed in the audience that are having fun, get them up for act four as well. Act five, we're going to build, 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 and then leave them with what we want to leave them with. Is it a happy birthday? Is it a message that your corporate booker wanted you to leave them with? Or is it your personal message to them? And if you don't have one, think about that. What would you like your audience to leave their thinking? How would you like them on the ride home to talk about that show? What would you want one husband to say to his wife and say, hey, that was a really good show. It made me, what is that? Answer it for yourself and it'll help you to design your character as well as to routine your show. Okay. <clears throat> so before we jump off, do you have, are there any questions you have about routining or structuring a show? Absolutely. Thank Let's you go. for asking. All right. So uh, your five act, um, your five, uh, what's it called? Five act structure. structure. Yeah. Um, I want to say I cut start, here yeah. and start over because yeah. didn't say much. Um, absolutely. So depending on your five act structure, mm -hmm. Uh, you said every act in your five act structure has roughly two tricks or two effects in it. Yep. Okay. This adds up to roughly an hour of show. 45 to an hour. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. So for, um, for people who don't do 45 to one hour shows because they're not in the corporate world or uh, just booked for smaller gigs or whatever, would this structure also apply? So give me an example of a show because most people want either a, a 30 or a 45 minute show. Right. Um, so even if you weren't booked in a corporate world, what where would you be doing the show? I don't know. For friends, for families, whatever. So. I guess the question I, is, I'm just asking, can I take this structure and apply it to much, much sort of time spans? And if so, how would I need to merge individual acts? So how would I need to choose? Effects so I can fit my time frame or fit only, I don't know, four effects, three effects in a row, but still make sure that I have a strong hello, that I can involve the audience, that I get my, my, my hardest hitting piece. Um, sure. So let's say you have a, a 20 minute show. Perfect. Yeah. So how would you take the five act structure and do a 20 minute show? You wouldn't do a five act structure, right? Um, with 20 minutes, I know I still, the basis of what I'm trying to do is hit them hard from the start then let them know who my character is, mm -hmm. have fun with them while reinforcing my character, hit them with a blockbuster to remember me by, and then send them off with a message. So say we want to do that in 20 minutes, okay? Yeah. Let's break it out into four effects that we're going to get into 20 minutes, mm -hmm. five, minute, five minutes each, okay? Yeah. So now we have a four act structure with one effect in each act. We'll okay. say five minutes, five minutes, five minutes, five minutes. That first, I want to hit them really hard. And I know I have five minutes in this first act. Okay, so instead of one trick for five minutes, I'm gonna come out and I'm gonna do the bottle opener and mm -hmm. hit him really hard quick. Hello, wham, bam, that's a minute and a half. I'm gonna now take that extra three and a half minutes and move it to the second act, okay? okay. So now I've got a second act, I've hit, I've hit them hard, I have a minute and a half there. Now I have a second act that I've got eight and a half minutes in. So now what I'll do, is I'll build some rapport with another quick three minute trick, like a rope mm -hmm. trick or something, and allow myself enough time in that eight and a half minutes to then get an audience member on stage. Okay. Yep. So let's say three minute rope routine, and then a five and a half minute stage, uh, stage piece, or I'm sorry, uh, audience participation piece. Mm -hmm. That leaves me with 10 more minutes, right? Yeah. So I want a blockbuster and a message. 
in 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to do a seven minute long blockbuster, probably my book test. Yeah. So that's going to be seven. And now I have three minutes to leave them with a message. I only need about a minute. So now I have two more minutes to add something in there. So remember, we talked about the ebb and flow a minute and a half, three minutes, five minutes, mm -hmm. seven. So it's building. Now, if you look at the arc of your timeline, it's going to be building. Now we have a seven minute piece here. Mm -hmm. So now I want to do something short and then leave them with the message. I saw an interview of Silly Billy, and he's a kid's entertainer, as you know better than I am. And um, he's always talking about interactions per minute, not laughs per minute, but interactions per mm. minute. Yeah, I mean, with kids, 100%, you've got to, every 30 seconds, you have to be at them. Um, Cody Fisher talks a lot about laughs per minute as well. Mm -hmm. I don't dive that deep into it. Um, I think it's a great, a great thing to be aware of, you know, how many times are you either interacting with your audience? If you don't interact with your audience at all, can you still have a good show? I would argue, yes. Um, Derek Delgadio has very little interaction in his, in and of itself. Of course, at the end, he almost overdoes it because everyone in the audience gets interacted with. Uh, but I've seen other shows with very little interaction that still play well. I've also seen shows with almost no humor that play well. You know, so laughs per minute, interactions per minute are going to be very much based around knowing your audience and knowing your character. It's not something I pay attention to, but I think it's a great thing to pay attention to. How often do you, do you have your audience laughing? With my show, every trick in my show is comedy based. So there, there should be laughing every effect. I know what laugh lines I want and where I put them to, again, help with the release of tension, mm -hmm. right? So a joke is drama yeah. because there's a conflict, there's tension. What the hell's the punchline? Ah, there it is. So I think this may be wrong, but I think too many laughs could cause too much release, uh, tension and release and could take away from the magic. Um, so let's say I'm thinking this through as I'm saying it, because I don't want to sound like a fool, but my gut is that if you came out, told a joke, did a magic trick, told another joke, then another joke, then did a magic trick, and then told a couple more jokes. The magic is very much secondary at that point. And you're now a comedian using magic as a crutch, right? So I don't pay attention to laughs per minute or interactions per minute. I really care about more about the entire show structure, right? So if it's, even if it's 15 minutes, we get 15 minutes, you've got to you're doing an MC bit and you get 15 minutes. So is that a show? Absolutely. It is a show. It's a 15 minute show. So in that case, I might just do three, three effects, an opener for a minute and a half, a five minute piece, and then something with the audience for 10 minutes. Um, you know, it's to me, I wouldn't care about how often is the audience laughing as long as I can build the tension and release it a few times. So the audience feels like they, they've had a complete show from start to finish. They don't, they're not left wanting more. And at the end of my show, they're not thankful that it's over. If that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. Um, building your set, mm -hmm. right? Um, we all, I guess everybody who is in magic understands practicing one trick and showing one trick to your family, to your friends and so on. Um, is practicing one trick only so basically having only one trick in your repertoire, a good idea, or would you practice in sets of three, for example, just to start out with routining? Because in my experience, if somebody asked me if I can show a trick, one is in 99% of all the cases to, to let, to not enough, enough, right? Because not to enough, say, yeah. show me another one, and I don't know how to segue properly into the next one. Okay. Um, but I found out if I have three card tricks, for example, I could use one trick to set up the deck in, in a specific order mm -hmm. for the next one, right? For example, having this, uh, what is this called? This uh, drunk shuffle, slump shuffle? Yep, a yep. slop or drunk shuffle, yeah. Perfect. This uh, could be also used, for example, to separating red from black, mm -hmm. not only um, making, um, making it appear that face up cards go into face down cards. So my first trick would be a triumph effect. My second trick would be some uh, pick, a, pick a card and I find it by basically Color separation or color an oil separation. and water or something. 
Um, but doing it right under the gaze of the spectator, right? He's, he's watching one effect and I can prepare my deck for the next one and then go from there into, into another piece. So from a um, setup, once one effect to the next, from this perspective, how would you approach this? What is the question? Do When I learn a trick, do I learn multiple tricks at the same time Absolutely. so they flow together? Sure. Um, no, that's a lie. I don't, but I know what you're saying. And yeah, I think it's a reasonable thing. If let's say I want to learn a new card trick and I've never learned it. So I learned that trick. I'm going to focus more on that trick to start. Mm -hmm. Then I got that trick down to myself. I know the moves. Yeah. Um, then I'll show some friends, uh, close friends, right? Yeah. You like, I'll hit you up and be like, Hey, check this out. People who know, all right, he's just showing me something he's working on. Whereas if I'm going out, people don't, you know, you don't go, Oh, I'm working on something here. There's that. Cause of course they're going to go shoot what's next. So to think in sets of that, um, I have my set I go out with. Right. Mm -hmm. And I know those tricks work together. So let's say I practice that single trick and I love it. Um, for me, I just know I have two other tricks that I love to do that mm -hmm. would fit. I don't have to in close up. I don't really, oh, I'm talking about scrolling close up, not formal sit down close yeah. up. Cause that's the environment you're talking about. You're at a friend's, you show them something, they want to see another. I just have my three or four favorite tricks and I'll just go into the next trick. So mm -hmm. an instance would be, I want to do immaculate connection. I just learned that. Right. So or pretend I just learned that I've known it for years, but let's say you do it. Boom. Now I know the next thing I want to do is going to be mental photo because mm -hmm. now they've seen something. I'm not really going to beat immaculate connection after that. Right. Maybe I open with Dr. Daly's last card trick, which is a sleight of hand card trick. I would do that. Then I would pull out mental photo mm -hmm. and then I would do immaculate connection. Is that routine? Great. No, because it's three card tricks in a row. But at least it's a regular deck card trick. Then it's some weird thing they've never seen with blank mm -hmm. cards. And then it's tearing cards and using cards for something that they would never think of a card trick. But that's just me knowing the tricks I love to do and bringing them out. So I would never learn a trick and then go, okay, what trick could I do right after this in a strolling set that would fit with this? Just because I'm just pulling from, well, what tricks would I bring out with me? Well, today I want to do mental photo and I'm going to bring out what, where, when, why. So maybe I'll bring out some coins as well. So I guess to answer your question, I don't think of them that way, but if you wanted to, and let's say you wanted to practice and say, I want to get four tricks that go really well together in a close up set. Great. You learn your first one and it's the same idea. It's the building of the, that sort of, are you doing something that's boring for the audience, right? Uh, that's, the, that's the question you always want to ask. And if you do oil and water out of this world and then triumph, mm -hmm. I think that's boring to the audience, yeah. right? They're too similar. The, the buildup and release of them is all pretty much the same. It's two color separation ones and then an upside down and right side up separation one. So... I think just looking at your tricks and going, is that boring? Like you may love them. You may love those tricks. So that's, those are the ones you practice. Then I would suggest practice something yeah. else, pick up some coins, learn a spoon bench, right? Just so you can break up the monotony of, I mean, I don't even love doing two card tricks in a row, straight card tricks with like, here's a regular deck and I'll do two or three regular card tricks in a row. I want to at least throw a mental photo in or uh, uh, Immaculate Connection or something that changes the dynamic of another card trick. And I mean, I don't do co coin work, but I specifically know two coin routines just so if I'm at, a, if I'm at a house party and I'm doing magic a lot, I can pull something out besides playing cards. So, you know, I think as far as close up, I, I wouldn't overthink it, but I would think about it. What tricks can I do that would go well with this? Mm -hmm. And then have three or four, and it doesn't play around with which ones you do first and second, you know, save your, your best one for last. Um, you know, they say you want them leaving wanting more. So if you save the very best one you have to do at the, the very end, just look at the rest of them and say, are these two similar mm -hmm. in presentation or in prop or in anything? Are they just too similar? Is it too repetitive? Because even if they're really good, there's not a whole lot of magicians that can hold your attention for too long with just a deck of cards. Pick your cards, find the cards, pick your cards, find the cards. I mean, cards, even, yeah. you know, Ricky J, his stuff, it's all cards, but if you look at what they are, they're not all card tricks, right? The dynamics of his show are yeah, so not. 
he has this mind mind reading toucans and yeah. a bunch of funny props. He splits it up, then his cups and balls routine, the history lesson, and all yeah, that. exactly. So he's, he mixes it up pretty good. But uh, ending with your best trick. Yeah. Um, uh, in this last question, this is the final question. Um, I want to iterate on two things. One is ending with your best trick. The other one is your five x structure. Okay. Can this apply? to a strolling walk around setting as well because there is there's also the thinking start with your best trick because mm -hmm. for whatever reason the some some waiter could put on some water on the tables yeah. and interrupt your trick or like last night um, you were strolling for roughly an hour or so between the tables mm -hmm. and then uh, the guests were invited into the bigger dining hall sure and you were right in the middle of the presentation, never when it's going to happen. So there could be the point that you will never be able to, to show this, these people your best trick. Sure. Should you start with your best one in this case? Well, all of them should be strong enough. Yeah, that, the standard is on. Yeah, I mean, if I, if I only showed one trick to a table and got interrupted, that one trick should stand on its own, right? Yeah. So all of your effects need to be very good, right? Don't, don't do shit magic. It's, um, who, what was the name of this lovely gentleman who said that in, in the Magic Club Vienna? Albert? Was it Albert? I don't know. I don't remember. The older gentleman with the uh, spectacular coin, coin works. What did he say? Oh, yeah. Yeah. He said, uh, just, just yeah. don't practice shit tricks because yeah, yeah. it saves you a lot of time. So do less and get better. Exactly. It's great. <laughs> really it's like a great. That. I mean, it's a perfect point. <laughs> we were just at uh, Magic Club here in Vienna. And yeah, the guy was doing coin magic and that's exactly what he said was, if you want to not work as hard, just don't practice the shit tricks, right? There's a lot out there and there's a lot of really good. So just only look at the good ones. And if you practice it once and go, eh, it's not that good, then just like really good, then get rid of it. So that, I mean, I think that rings true. There isn't a trick I do in strolling that I wouldn't be happy to end on. Yeah. With the idea of being interrupted, you know, modulating your tricks so you could have multiple endings. Ambitious card's a great example because every time it comes to the top, that could be the end of the trick. Yeah. Or maybe I want to do in case of emergency, but a waiter comes and I can't. Yeah. All right, they, they still saw the card come up to the top a bunch. Yeah. That was pretty cool, right? So um, I don't do a five-act structure or try and think of strolling in that capacity. Again, I just try and think of varying the props and varying the presentations. Mm -hmm. um, all your tricks should be good enough to stand on their own when you open for strolling for sure there should be excuse me there should be a quick opener right which is uh the gap lighter project which will be coming out soon there's a thing on there that is perfect for the opener because it's not they don't know it's a trick um you know what hold on we're gonna cut and i'm gonna go get it so you can see this all right, for example purposes, this is a perfect opener for strolling because they don't know it's a trick, it's quick, and before they can even say, no, we don't want to see any magic, I just come up and interrupt them. And a lot of times in strolling, you'll interrupt uh, people talking. So I say, I'm sorry, did anybody here drop a lighter? Uh, I found it on the floor next to you guys. Is this anyone that's got a polar bear on it on both sides? Nobody's? It's weird too. It says, how much does a polar bear weigh? That's nobody's? Well, does anybody know how much a polar bear does weigh? And now at this point, they've all stopped talking. Somebody's going to answer, whatever the answer may be. I just say, oh, actually, it weighs exactly, if I shake it, oh, <laughs> enough to break the ice. Hey, I'm Adam. I'm the magician for this evening. So that's a perfect example of an opener for close-up that's quick. I don't have to come up and say, hey, can I show you a card trick? Uh, I used to always walk up and say, oh, excuse me, can I show you something amazing? And then I would do a card trick that took 60 seconds or less, something very, very quick, usually a, a double lift into their hand and it changes to their card. But the idea I think still rings true heavily when you, before somebody's ever seen you, if you're going up and you're saying, I'm a magician, you better show them something within 60 seconds that allows them to say, all right, you, you can have some of my attention. A lot of people have notions of what they think a magician is. And if, if you're good and you're worth your weight, then we should, you know, within 60 seconds, be able to say, no, I'm not what you think a magician is. And this is going to be fun. Take 60 seconds and show them something. Okay. So open with something really strong and strolling, but then I just try and piece as many of the best pieces of magic I can together and make sure I'm not doing too many using the same props or the same theme. Um, 
in a row. You're, you're never really going to do more than five tricks at a strolling gig, at least per table. So if you had five gigs, do maybe two card tricks, a coin trick, a rope trick, and then ring flight or something like that. Um, but certainly don't walk up and do five card tricks in a row and uh, make sure your first opening trick isn't, you know, some elongated multi-phase uh, double climax triumph that happened, you know, make sure it's quick and punchy so they understand I'm good. They give you your attention and, uh, you know, like you said, be expected. There's a good chance you'll be interrupted and mm -hmm. do your best to not get furious about it, but it'll happen. Waiters I'll try will. to come up with uh, witty lines to yep. incorporate it. Yep. But don't make the wait staff, like I used to make fun of the wait staff for interrupting me and um, don't do that. It's, it's not good. It's not professional and it's not their fault. One smart thing you can do so you don't have to get into that situation is talk to the wait staff beforehand and say, hey, they've hired me. I'm the entertainer. This is what I'm going to be doing. If you see me at a table, don't interrupt with hors d'oeuvres or drinks. Uh, just circle back through on the next one because the event coordinator hired me to make sure everybody sees entertainment. And it's literally just letting them know because they have no idea. 99% of the time, they'll be fine with that. No problem. Thanks for letting me know. All right. But I guess that's it. Let's wrap it up. That was a long video, but thanks for staying with us. It's a big, hefty topic. We're going to do some more uh, in-depth stuff on it. But like I said, there's a PDF link below and that'll go into a lot more detail on the five act structure, how you can use it. Hopefully you take some advantage. So thanks again. We'll see you on the next one. Take care.